I want to take a few minutes to highlight the results of some recent surveys we've conducted and along the way uh, describe some trends that we've observed. But uh, more importantly, highlight uh, parts of the program in this conference over the next two days. So last July, we conducted a survey. It drew over 11,000 respondents. And at the time, we found that uh, many companies were already serious about machine learning. So we measured uh, how many companies uh, were already in production as far as machine learning. So with all the hype with ML and AI, uh, it's very tempting to jump into complex use cases. But we found through our surveys and actually the survey of other companies that uh, the, the uh, organizations who succeed in machine learning uh, tend to build upon existing analytic use cases. So basically, you might imagine having a business intelligence service uh, that runs on some data you already have and layering some machine learning on top of it. So take, for example, deep learning, which is the subject of many talks at this conference. Um, so how are, how are companies using deep learning? So two, two uh, major ways stand out. The first is they use deep learning to either replace or augment machine learning systems that they already have, or they use deep learning to introduce new data types to, uh, to any, some of their systems, right? So, so at this conference, we have many sessions on the use of deep learning, uh, for example, for time series. Uh, Arun, uh, Kajariwal, and Ira Cohen will be giving a survey of the use of uh, deep learning for time series. And also text. So we have the creators of Spark NLP and Spacey uh, here at the conference. And also we have uh, Munya Lalmas of uh, Spotify who will describe how they modernize their uh, recommender systems. So machine learning is also changing how we approach uh, software development itself, right? So, um, so increasingly, software development will probably look like machine learning. So you, you'll have to uh, collect training data and use it to automate uh, some, some software system. So the important thing to note is we are still very much in an empirical era for ML. So we need uh, big data big compute and big models. And specifically, tools for uh, managing training data are going to be key to sustaining success in ML. So uh, what, what do you need exactly? So you need um, uh, to be able to build pipelines at scale and uh, uh, in a routine fashion, and uh, to keep those pipelines flowing so that you have good, clean data that will be usable for machine learning. And uh, to build these pipelines repeatedly, you need, to, you need to have the right tools. So with an eye towards uh, machine learning, we conducted a survey late last year. So our goal was twofold. Uh, first, we wanted to find out what tools people are using. So no surprise, a lot of Spark, a lot of Kafka, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on, right? So, but we also wanted to find out are people building the right things in order to sustain uh, machine learning within their organizations? So one of the qu main questions was, what are you building? So not surprisingly, uh, data integration was on top of the list. Because after all, everything begins with collecting and aggregating data. So we have many talks at this conference. We have a whole slate of sessions on data integration and modern EPL including talks from Ted Malaska of Capital One and Matt Schulze of Solando. But uh, make sure you check your program. So an important part of getting uh, data ready for machine learning is preparing and cleaning it. Uh, so much so that there is now even a new research area among academics called data programming, which is basically uh, unifies all the techniques for programmatically creating uh, training sets. And to that end, we are beginning to see uh, human-in-the-loop systems where you have domain experts uh, training uh, data preparation tools that can then operate at scale and clean and prepare data at scale. So many of these companies will be at this conference. So for example, one of the leading experts in data programming, Ehab Ilyas of uh, the University of Waterloo in Canada, but also a co-founder of Tamer, will speak this afternoon on how one can solve 
data cleaning using modern machine learning techniques. So you'll also need to understand what data you have and who can access it. So as you can see, about a third of the people in our survey are already uh, looking at data governance solutions and data catalogs. So there are also open source tools. So uh, a couple of Bay Area companies, so Uber has a, a project called Databook, and WeWork has a project called Marques. But there are also uh, companies here at our expo hall, including Alation and Immuta, who are building tools in this area. Uh, if, so if you're in, interested in data governance uh, as, a, as a, to a broad topic, I recommend a session this afternoon by Paco Nathan. He will be giving an executive briefing on data governance and data catalogs. So in the past, we got by with a rather cavalier attitude towards data sources. But th that is ending. So with discussions around data ethics, security, and privacy, uh, it's very important to talk about lineage and provenance. So specifically, where does the data come from? How was it got, gathered, and how was it modified along the way? So the need to audit and reproduce ML pipelines makes it increasingly a legal and security issue. That's why uh, companies are beginning to really uh, seriously build data lineage solutions. So at this conference, we have a few sessions on, on this topic, uh, including talks from Intuit, Lyft, and Accenture. Uh, but there are also open source projects that are beginning to address data lineage. So there's a project called DVC, and uh, Delta Lake uh, is also builds in some data lineage capability. So as the number of data scientists grows within your company, uh, you need to start thinking about uh, something, what, something that's called a, like a data science platform which is basically a tool where your data scientists can collaborate, uh, share features, share models, and also uh, have a standardized uh, set of uh, machine learning libraries. So many of these modern data science platforms uh, support multiple machine learning libraries, right? So they tend to support uh, the usual deep learning libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch, but also Scikit-Learn and even R. So at this conference, we'll have many sessions from companies. Uh, specifically, uh, they'll talk about what trade-offs and design choices they made towards building their data science platform. So some of the companies who are going to uh, be presenting on their internal data science platforms at this conference include Zalando, Alibaba, Stitch Fix, Uber, and Gojek. But there's also many companies at, the, at our expo hall who uh, offer data science platform solutions, including our partners Cloudera, Anaconda, Data IQ, and faculty. So we found that a majority of companies are already using public cloud options for at least parts of their data infrastructure. And in fact, uh, uh, we had a question where we asked them if they were already aware or using serverless. And about a third of the companies uh, signaled that uh, they used one of the seven serverless options we provided. Uh, so during trainings and tutorials, we had numerous offerings on the topic of serverless. And we'll continue to have talks over the next few days on the importance of serverless for modern data pipelines and architectures, including a talk today by Avner Braverman, who will explain the role of serverless for data and machine learning. So it's our belief that the use of machine learning it will continue to grow over the next few years, right? So a couple of major reasons. The first is 5G. It's, uh, it's just beginning to be rolled out. And uh, 5G will probably lead to many interesting machine-to-machine -machine applications, many of which will rely on machine learning. And secondly, towards the end of this year, we'll begin to see specialized hardware for machine learning, specifically uh, for the training and inference of deep learning. So uh, I suspect that around Q3 and Q4 of this year, we'll, for example, see uh, new hardware for training large deep, deep learning uh, architectures. So here we're talking about massive speed ups on the order of 15 to 20x in terms of uh, training time, or 40x even is, what, uh, is uh, what I've been led to believe. So imagine a model that took you 40 hours 
now takes one hour. So now you can go to lunch, your model training is, uh, is done. So that means that data scientists and machine learning researchers can experiment and try many more architectures. So there are also a couple of early indicators that machine learning will grow within companies. So Cassie was talking about the title data scientist, which has been used for the last maybe four to five years. So a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we began to notice a new job title emerging in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and this new role was dedicated to productionizing machine learning. So this was the machine learning engineer. And uh, companies who specialize in deep learning even had a, a more specific role called, called uh, deep learning engineer. So the machine learning engineers sit somewhere between data science and engineering and ops. Uh, they tend to have stronger programming skills. Um, but more importantly for you, they are also more highly compensated than data scientists. So uh, you may want to go back to your manager and sneakily tell them, hey, yeah, uh, maybe I can uh, change my title to machine learning engineer and then change jobs, right? So, uh, so there, uh, in fact, in my Twitter poll, there seems to be early indications that data scientists are beginning to rebrand themselves into this new job title. Now, the important thing to remember about machine learning engineers in practice, particularly in the Bay Area startup scene, is they are uh, uh, come from more of an engineering background. So the expectation is uh, uh, they have stronger programming skills than your typical data scientist. Another sign that machine learning uh, uh, is going to increase in importance is to look at uh, some of the new projects that have really gained traction. So take, for example, MLflow. It's 10 months old. Uh, as you can see, there's already over 200 plus companies using it. Um, and a common use case for MLflow is experiment tracking and management. Um, in fact, when MLflow was released, uh, I, I kind of suspected it was going to be popular because there was really no good tool for doing this. Um, and so. It, it's been confirmed, right? So you can see the number of contributors has grown, uh, GitHub stars is growing, and then more importantly, the actual use cases in production. So now there are also startups building tools for managing machine learning development, and uh, companies in our expo hall offer uh, similar solutions within their uh, data science platform offerings. So as the uh, as machine learning practice expands in many parts of your companies, it will become clear that you will need specialized tools, right? So MLflow is great, but it really only takes care of uh, ML uh, machine learning development, right? So as you begin to uh, evaluate data science platform solutions, you'll have to ask many questions. So I've tried to list some of the key criteria that uh, these people in the Bay Area are talking about. Uh, so, for example, uh, we, talk a lot about, we talk a lot about deep learning, but the reality is uh, uh, companies will use many types of machine learning techniques, right? So uh, support vector machines are still used within Facebook, uh, XGBoost is popular, and so in time series, the traditional statistical models will still be important. So you'll need to kind of understand uh, uh, how the data science platform you're building is able to support a variety of many machine learning tools. So if you are a manager or decision maker struggling with some of these topics, I highly recommend a session this afternoon by Pete Skomarach of Workday. Uh, he will be giving an outstanding executive briefing this morning uh, around these topics. So now Pete doesn't come to London often, so uh, even if you can't come, can't come to his talk, reach out. So he's one of the really uh, deep thinkers in this area. So, and just like uh, data are assets, so I talked about data governance. So data governance solutions are really uh, uh, gaining in popularity. So more and more startups are building data governance solutions. And more and more companies are recognizing that they need data governance and data catalogs. <laughs> Uh, models will also become valuable assets. And as such, they will need to be managed and protected. So we will also need specialized tools for model governance and model operations. And we're beginning to see uh, startups and companies building 
uh, tools for just this purpose. So you'll need, for example, you'll need probably the ability to list all of the models you have, right? So a model catalog, mo model catalog. Uh, the ability to know uh, who has the author authorization to deploy models or read and write uh, certain models. And more importantly, I think, uh, if you look at just uh, the monitoring of models, uh, you will need dashboards, but these dashboards may have specific views, right? So you might have a, a, a different dashboard for a data scientist. You may have a different dashboard for a business user, and you might have a different dashboard for the uh, machine learning engineer or the data ops person. So uh, there will be a great talk this morning on model governance and model operations for the enterprise by Jerry Sue of Datatron. So we're also beginning to recognize that machine learning is much more than just optimizing uh, statistical or business metrics. So we will need to monitor a lot of things. Uh, and in this conference, we have many great sessions touching on fairness, explainability, and particularly security and privacy. Um, so for example, Mickey Braun is giving a survey talk on fair and privacy preserving and secure machine learning. And after a, a year hiatus, Duncan Ross and Francine Bennett are back with their Using for Data Evil series, this time focused on AI. So these re risks are no longer theoretical, right? So they're real. So for example, uh, a recent survey of, of GDPR uh, found that uh, uh, there have been many, many reports of, uh, of breaches already, right? So, the, so increasingly, these tools for uh, privacy preserving machine learning and uh, data security and privacy are going to be required and not, uh, not uh, optional. Um, so I recommend a uh, executive briefing today by Mark Donsky of O'Hara. He will give you an update on worldwide privacy regulations, GDPR, California uh, Privacy Act, and many more. So in closing, we tend to think of machine learning as producing a model or uh, an ensemble of models that we need to deploy. Uh, but it, it, we're increasingly beginning to realize that auditing and maintaining machine learning can actually be challenging because uh, it actually involves a series of algorithms, right? So there's the actual model that you will deploy to production, but there might be a sequence of models, uh, the trainer or the pipeline uh, that involves things like stochastic gradient descent that uses uh, data to produce this model. So managing machine learning models uh, I can't reinforce enough, uh, requires a set of foundational tools that I try to highlight and uh, which will be the subject of many sessions over the next two days. So we have an outstanding program for you over the next two days. There will be many sessions on topics that are critical to making sure that you succeed in your journey towards machine learning. and. Uh, as a conference organizer, so of course, I'm very proud of the program we put together, but don't forget to network with other people at the conference. So, right? So, with our speakers, with your fellow attendees, and with our sponsors in the expo hall. So, for the next two days, this is your data and machine learning community. And uh, one of the ways, actually, that you can reach out to your fellow attendees is uh, using Twitter. So, use the hashtag and uh, and uh, start discussions with your fellow attendees. So thank you, and have a good program for the next two days.